so bored. How can you be bored? Nature is the mega show, a most exciting, most unpredictable, and occasionally most devastating show. Do you realize that somewhere there's been an earthquake while we've been sitting here? Maybe not a major one, but every 30 seconds, there is an earthquake somewhere on Earth. Sounds like there's a whole lot of shaking going on. <laughs> yeah, humans feel only about 60,000 of those earthquakes each year, which means the vibrations are strong enough to be felt about once every 10 minutes. But that's just part of the show. Haven't you seen some of those natural disaster movies? Yeah. yeah. What were some of those shows about? Huh, let's see. Tornadoes. Right. Hurricanes. Tsunamis, those giant ocean waves. Yeah, did you see that one about the meteorite that hit the Earth? Yeah, like the one that took out the dinosaurs. That is the theory, but no one is sure what really happened to the dinosaurs. Large meteorites have crashed into the Earth throughout the history of the world. Some of them have drastically changed the environment. A closer look at our world shows that nature can unleash uncontrollable forces, and we humans try to survive. Okay, what are some natural disasters that change the Earth's crust? A volcano. That's a good one. What could be a more obvious crustal change than a volcano? And a great place to find out more about volcanoes is at Mount St. Helens National Volcanic Monument. Over millions and billions of years, the volcanoes have released the gases which form our oceans and our atmosphere. Uh, they form the land we live on. When molten rock reaches the surface of the Earth, it forms a volcano. Where the magma or molten rock actually oozes out onto the surface of the Earth to become lava, that area is known as the vent. And over time, this molten rock, which is lighter than the surrounding rocks, begins to rise up and on up through the Earth's crust until eventually parts of it reach the surface to form a chain of volcanoes. The Cascade Range that we know today is really about, only about a million years old. And the youngest of these volcanoes is Mount St. Helens. It's only about 40,000 years old. On the morning of May 18th, there was a magnitude 5.1 earthquake, which triggered the collapse of the North Flank. That uncorked the superheated groundwater and volcanic gases that were trapped within the volcano. So like a giant steam explosion, like tearing the lid off a pressure cooker, Mount St. Helens expanded outward in a tremendous sideways-facing blast. And this superheated stone-filled wind shooting out of the volcano at speeds of over 300 miles an hour screamed out across the landscape to a distance of about 15 to 20 miles leveling most of the forest. The cloud of ashes was 12 miles high and fell on communities in three different states. Resulting mud flows covered some homes and highway bridges as well as clogging up part of the Columbia River. After the disastrous activity was over, it was time for scientists to assess the damage. Well, when we first came up here in, in 1980, it looked completely lifeless. I mean, the area was kind of almost like a moonscape. But as we looked around more carefully, we began to see that there were little sprigs of green from plants that were sprouting. One of the lessons I think I've learned and many scientists have learned from Mount St. Helens is that the volcano creates as well as destroys. So we're standing on what remains of Mount St. Helens. We're actually several hundred feet above the old valley floor. These small ponds and wetlands were created as a result of the chunks of the volcano that were tossed into this valley. We're standing here about seven miles from the volcano, but we're also, importantly, next to the edge of the valley. We're in the areas where those first seeds landed. So these trees are older than the ones you might find out in the center. So it kind of gives us a glimpse into the future. What many areas will look like in another five or ten years. Mount St. Helens gives us a chance to see how volcanoes have reshaped nature and then how nature in turn reshapes the landscape around the volcano. And what about a volcano's threat to humans? While scientists now know more than ever about volcanoes, these violent mountains still remain a hazardous threat to communities of nearby people. Volcanic areas tend to be some of the richest agricultural areas on Earth. And so it's no surprise that many civilizations have grown up around volcanoes and that we still tend to encroach upon them today, even though when the volcano does awake, it can be quite devastating for these uh, cities. More than 80% of the Earth's surface, above and below sea level, was formed by volcanic activity. Holy mackerel! What other kinds of natural forces do we observe on the crust of the Earth? How about an earthquake? That's right. Earthquakes can create huge natural disasters. And one region that's had its share of earthquake disasters is California, a state well known for its ground-shaking experience. 
It's an older building. It was really flexing quite a bit. The refrigerator walked down into the middle of the kitchen. The building was shaking hard enough that I did actually have to hang on. And the other thing that kept happening was the electricity kept coming on and off. Never felt anything like it. I, I hope I don't feel something like that again. Many of the earthquakes in the world occur due to the forces of plate tectonics. Plate tectonics is the idea that the Earth's surface is broken up into what we call tectonic plates. And as these plates slowly move side by side, they build up what we call elastic strain energy. This is much like the energy that's built up in a spring when you stretch it. Eventually, so much stress gets built up that that fault breaks, an earthquake occurs, and all that stored up motion gets released in a few seconds. When we're talking about plate tectonics in California, we're concerned with two major plates, the Pacific Plate on the west and the North America Plate on the east. Between these two major plates is the San Andreas Fault System. It's not a single fault, but rather a group of several faults. You can see this road right here uh, that cuts across our little model here, that's, and there's a fault coming down the middle of it. And because of plate tectonics, stress builds up in the Earth, and then it's very rapidly released in an earthquake. Now you can see that the road that was originally continuing across the fault is now offset. And you can see evidence for that all over the Bay Area. So we're here at the football stadium where the Hayward Fault runs right down end zone to end zone. What it has been doing is it's been moving slowly along in a process that we call aseismic creep. Now that creep is slowly tearing the stadium apart right here at the seams. The two parts of the curb used to be connected, and we've been monitoring them since the early 1970s as the fault has slowly caused them to separate. By figuring out how fast the fault is moving, we can determine how much stress is building up. The more stress that builds up, the more likely an earthquake will be. The biggest earthquake ever recorded in San Francisco was back in 1906. It was a magnitude 8.3. The history of earthquakes here in the Bay Area helps to provide important clues about when another big earthquake might happen. We brought over a device that they invented in Japan, which allows us to sample below the water table and actually bring up slices of the fault for us to study on the surface of the ground. Well, at this location, we have found about four earthquakes within the last 700 years. And so on average, earthquakes along this part of the Hayward Fault occur about every 150 to 200 years. The last earthquake on the Hayward Fault was in 1868. And so perhaps in the next 100 years, we can be fairly confident that the Hayward Fault will generate another earthquake. There are actually earthquakes that occur in every state of the United States. Some parts of the United States have more earthquakes because of the relation to the plate boundaries. In the late 1800s, there was a very large destructive earthquake in Charleston. And in New Madrid, Missouri, very center of the country, a quite rural area, there were three earthquakes within a space of six months in the early 1800s. The 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake in San Francisco had a relative size or magnitude of 6.9. Buildings collapsed, bridges and freeways crumbled, and 63 people were killed. What we have learned is to identify areas that are particular risk of damage from earthquakes. We operate a network of seismic and other instruments in northern and central California. So down here we have an example of a seismometer. And this is effectively a very fancy pendulum with a mass to record earth motion. California and other parts of the United States are blanketed with seismometers, and those signals are sent back by a variety of means to central computers. And by looking at how big those signals are, which is a measure of how much the ground shook, that gives an indication of the earthquake size. These days, you can go on the World Wide Web within about a minute or two and be provided with a map that shows you where and when and how large that earthquake was. Where we're really uh, falling short is being able to predict the time of the earthquake. And currently, we cannot predict earthquakes. And the hope is by having these sorts of data, we'll learn much more about the process that leads up to an earthquake. The average rate of motion across the San Andreas Fault Zone is usually about A, two inches per year, B, two feet per year, C, 20 feet per year, or D, 200 feet per year. And the answer to the Tacklebox Brain Teaser 
The San Andreas Fault moves about two inches per year. That's about the same as the rate of growth for your fingernails. Cutting edge technology is being used in areas of high earthquake risk. At Stanford University, they're helping design buildings that can withstand these violent ground shakes. Yeah, so what we're looking at is a uh, earthquake simulator or shake table. Uh, it's big enough to put models on it, but certainly not full-size buildings. And we're going to see the building shaking. Um, it's powered by hydraulics. It's then connected to a computer controller. And we've actually taken records, measured records from actual earthquakes, how the ground moves. And we can reproduce those on this table. I mean, this is a model of a, uh, as we see here, a five-story building. It's an idealized model. This is made out of aluminum. Actual structures would be steel, concrete, wood. Taller structures tend to be more flexible. Short ones tend to be more rigid. OK, next we're going to run some actual earthquake ground motions through the table. So I'm going to run a, the, a record from the Northridge earthquake. This is the one that occurred in California in 1994. It was a magnitude 6.7 earthquake. This earthquake occurred early in the morning. Imagine being asleep in, in your bed at about 5, 5.30 in the morning and being waken up by uh, this kind of motion. The table's slowing down, but in fact, the building is moving more. Well, the first thing is to realize that buildings are not earthquake proof. They're earthquake resistant. But basically, what we do in structures to uh, resist earthquakes is give them adequate stiffness, strength. But then an additional component is, is ductility or toughness, the ability to become damaged and to absorb the energy from the earthquake without collapsing. So in real life, we'll, we'll analyze our structures with computer models, and we use shake table experiments to validate those models. We also do other kinds of experiments on materials or sub-assemblies to understand those. And it's really all of those things put together that comprise earthquake engineers. When an earthquake occurs, uh, that's our, our real life laboratory. And that's the ultimate test of our theories and also how they're put into practice. A tsunami is a giant seismic ocean wave, which usually happens when an underwater earthquake shakes up the ocean. A tsunami can also be caused by a landslide or a volcano. Or by a big meteorite from space hitting the water. Another kind of natural disaster is a sinkhole. That's when the ground, instead of erupting outward, sags inward. It's caused by the ground collapsing. The state of Florida has a big problem with sinkholes. Well, sinkhole is the name of a, a surface landform. It's basically a, a shallow depression uh, bowl-shaped usually, and it's formed by some sort of karst erosion processes, which usually involves having the soil washed down into pre-existing caves. Sometimes it could be the collapse of a cave roof. We commonly see things like sinkholes and caves and large springs in areas that have soluble rocks like limestone, dolomite, or gypsum. Throughout the eastern United States, there are broad areas of, and belts of limestone that are at or near the Earth's surface. Florida is especially susceptible to sinkhole development because the limestone is at or near the ground surface in almost the entire northwest quarter of the Florida Peninsula. Sinkholes have two principal uh, effects on the environment. First of all, they, they can, in fact, damage houses, buildings, and other structures, but they also provide avenues that allow the, the rapid transport of contaminants into our drinking water supply. Sinkholes are having an increasing economic impact here in Florida. The largest and most destructive sinkhole in the history of Florida was the Winter Park sinkhole. It entirely swallowed one house, wrecked five or six other buildings, and destroyed a city swimming pool. All told, it did about four and a half million dollars worth of damage in only three days. In this ground-penetrating radar survey, radio waves are being beamed into the ground in pulses to construct an image that shows a cross-section of the soil layers. Ground-penetrating radar was invented by the U.S. government so that they could test for tunnels being built by saboteurs. Today, we're going to use GPR to see if Mother Nature is trying to mount a sneak sinkhole attack against this house. No sinkholes near this house, but fortunately, geologists like Bill Wilson are studying where and when future sinkholes might pop up. This information warns people to keep their property away from the collapsing holes. The next layer of disasters on Earth is weather disasters. For instance, a snowstorm. It can be a life and death disaster for people inside or outside. Another weather disaster is an avalanche. 
Think about the people killed and the wildlife sent scattering for new habitat. You can't stop an avalanche, but new technology helps experts give warnings so that people are not in the way when the snow does come down. You may have heard weathercasters mention something called El Nino or La Nina as a weather engine that drives all kinds of weather patterns. Hurricanes, tornadoes, droughts, floods, mudslides, and more. Now, to understand what El Nino does, you first need to know a little something about the Pacific Ocean. Usually, based on a number of factors, there are warm waters in the western tropical Pacific, while surface waters in the central and eastern tropical Pacific are cooler. But every two to seven years, changes in wind patterns and ocean currents cause warmer waters to drift eastward. These changes cause weather extremes in many areas around the world. When the reverse happens, weather casters refer to that as La Nina, sort of a sister to El Nino. Conditions caused by either phenomenon can be devastating. Severe weather can also pop up without El Nino or La Nina conditions. Hurricanes can devastate with heavy rain, storm surge flooding, and high winds over a broad area. Tornadoes don't just slam the towns that you see on the news, they also drastically change the environment by striking forests and natural spaces. Think about how technology has improved predictions of natural disasters. Today's satellite and radar technology allows minute-by-minute -minute plotting of weather conditions. Now, weather experts can issue warnings for disasters like tornadoes. Sophisticated hurricane monitoring also allows more accurate predictions of when and where a hurricane will make landfall. Because of new technology, hurricanes or other coastal storms never sneak up on us anymore. The tackle shop is a central location in this community. Emergency crews set up here to coordinate rescue missions or evacuations in times of natural disasters. Early warnings can save lives and reduce financial and ecological damage. If you live in an area prone to natural disasters, be sure you're prepared. Find out how to prepare at your local library or call the Red Cross. In preparing for possible disasters, the Internet is a wonderful source of information. Using this information properly can help mitigate or lessen your damages in a disaster. In our area of the country, hurricanes are frequent, so preparation includes storing critical supplies. Told you, there's never a dull moment on planet Earth. Things are always changing. That's why it's important to be prepared for the types of natural disasters that occur in your part of the country. That's all for our show. See you next time. Sounds like there's a whole lot of shaking going on. Can we laugh after that? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name. They're gonna think that's crazy. There's a whole lot of whole lot of, whole lot of shaking going on. Just plain strange, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Visit our Tackle Box website to learn more.